So uh, again, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to not only celebrate Africa Day with you, uh, but to also share some of the work that we do at Kenyatta University and uh, in relation to Striga and its hosts, uh, maize, finger millet, uh, palm millet, and sorghum. And for those who are not very familiar with the parasitic plant that I'm talking about, it would be the purple colored plant in the background of that screen. Uh, growing amidst uh, a sorghum crop. So Striga is, uh, has three uh, important species and I'm just displaying one of them. And we will be seeing uh, a lot more of those uh, purple colored and uh, green colored uh, uh, plants. So I just want to outline my uh, introduction as follows. I'll first give a very brief background about Striga. Uh, the Striga life cycle, the economic importance of Striga. And then I'll talk to you about some of the work we are doing to harness natural resistance uh, for, for Striga. Uh, and then we're also going to talk about the methods that we have been using to harness this natural resistance, uh, starting with that transcriptomic approach. And then I will go into other technologies like the genome-wide association analysis. And then I will conclude with some uh, future perspectives and current work. Uh, so, uh, to put us in the right frame of mind, I think we should first discuss the, the parasitic plants and put, put Striga in the context of other parasitic plants and very briefly define parasitic plants as plants that live off other plants. But this is a really broad definition because there are different categories of parasitic plants. And some of them are holoparasites, and that means they are absolute parasites. They must depend on their host at all stages in their life cycle. And then there are hemiparasites or hemiparasitic plants, and these are parasitic plants that depend on their host at some stage in their life cycle, but also have ability to carry out photosynthesis. And then there are also another categorization. There are obligate parasites, an obligate parasite must depend on their host at some stage in their life cycle. And then there's facultative parasites, which can choose to live with the host or without a host. So they have some ability to carry out photosynthesis, but they decide to be parasitic. And I'm using this slide from uh, Jim Westwood's lab, which, which really puts the parasitic plants, uh, the whole spectrum of parasitic plants, starting with uh, uh, Mimilis, which is the basal uh, or the, the free living uh, plant in this group of Orobanchesis. So Mimilis or the monkey plant has got ability to photosynthesize. And just next door to it or next to it is the parasitic plant um, Trephisaria and Trephisaria has got ability to photosynthesize. And so it is a facultative parasite. And then on the extreme, you have um, genus Orobanke, and genus Orobanke has got members that are holoparasitic, and these are obligate. So the genus Orobanke does not have any ability to carry out photosynthesis and must depend on a host. And then just next to it is uh, Striga, the genus of our discussion today. And the Striga genus is a hemiparasite, so it is dependent on a host. Uh, in its early stages of life cycle, uh, but it has ability to carry out photosynthesis after that. Uh, so the genus Striga itself has got many, many species, but the most economically important of this is the uh, Striga hamontica and Striga asiatica, which are parasitic to maize, millet, sorghum, uh, and other cereal grains. And then there is also Striga gesneroides, and Striga gesneroides is parasitic to cowpea and tobacco. Uh, with regard to distribution, these parasites are distributed mostly in sub-Saharan Africa. So you can see very high infestations uh, in uh, Eastern and Central Africa, as well as in West Africa. Uh, not so much infestation in uh, towards South or in South Africa, and very minimal infestation, in fact, in South Africa. As, as is the case in North Africa, you don't see a lot of Strega in North Africa, uh, but uh, most of it is distributed within Eastern and Central Africa. I should also say uh, the most uh, distributed species of Strega within Eastern Africa is uh, Strega hamontica and Strega asiatica, uh, not so much uh, Strega gesneroides. Uh, but then there's patches and uh, small patches of 
Stragagis Noridis within uh, some part of Eastern Africa. Uh, with regard to economic importance, Striga is a really important parasite. Uh, Striga causes 30 to 100 percent in yield losses, uh, and, and this is translates or this translates to about seven billion dollars in a year. So this is a huge amount of money, considering that this is a, a parasite that limits production of the very uh, staple cereals in Africa. So, uh, and especially maize, uh, sorghums, millet, uh, and, and other grains. Uh, and the methods that are used to control strike are not very effective. So farmers use trap crops, uh, or they use crop rotation, uh, or they use other um, agronomic and sanitization techniques, uh, such as also weeding. And these are very laborious and also very time consuming and, and only only really moderately effective. And so what people now propose to do is to combine all these methods together in an integrated approach, but an approach that highly leverage on resistance sources. And at this point, I want to pause and uh, describe the Striga biology or the Striga life cycle and, and really try to pin this at the back of our mind because this is going to, the presentation or the rest of this discussion is going to hinge on, on, on this slide. So the Striga life cycle uh, starts with uh, Striga getting stimulated to germinate by the host. So Striga does not germinate on its own. It is dependent on host signals for it to germinate. Remember, it's a parasite and it cannot be germinating at its own expense. So there has to be a host next door. And it locates its host very effectively by uh, sensing germination stimulants that come out of the host. These germination stimulants are called stregolactones, and these are a class of hormones that not only stimulate striga to germinate, but have got other physiological roles in the plant. Upon perception of these hormones, striga germinates very rapidly within uh, 12 to 24 hours. And after germination, uh, striga locates the host root and grows very fast and very furiously towards the host. It digs inside the host, continues growing inside the host and establishes a feeding structure called the hostorium. Now, the hostorium is a very specialized structure uh, because the cells that are very close to the host xylem differentiate again very rapidly to become xylem vessels. So these xylem vessels are the ones that the striga now uses to steal nutrients from the host. So you can see from this histological section uh, at the interface of the host and the parasite, the pipes of the xylems that are going into the parasite to, I mean, to the host to seek out nutrients and water. And we believe that there is more to just sucking out nutrients from the host. There is phytotoxicity at this point, because what we know is that retardation uh, sets in at this point, and it's really hard to recover. Uh, it's really hard for a plant to recover at this stage. So you can already see wilting uh, three days after infection by the parasite. Okay, so these are two critical stages in the Strega life cycle, but they also form very important control uh, points for Strega. So we broadly categorize this into two stages. So germination, uh, mechanisms of germination before striga has attached, so pre-attachment resistance, and then mechanisms of resistance that occur after striga has attached, so post-attachment resistance mechanisms. And the pre-attachment resistance mechanisms are mechanisms that are determined by the host cues. So is the host releasing germination stimulants? Is the host releasing uh, hostorium inducing factors? And if not, then those are considered resistance hosts because they'll not be able to stimulate the parasite to germinate. But then after germination, in case there was germination, then you have mechanisms that occur after the parasite has germinated. And these are called post-attachment resistance mechanisms. And what happens in this case are mechanisms that now block the entry of the parasite into the host. So we have various ways, uh, semi-high throughput techniques that we use in the lab to assay and to determine and quantify mechanisms of this resistance. The first one we use is a 
rhizotron assay. And the rhizotron assay is actually borrowed from uh, soil and root biologists. And these are 25 by 25 um, perspex chambers, uh, 25 centimeters by 25 centimeters perspex chambers. These are filled with an inert material, so vermiculite, for example. And then we line that with a mesh fabric, and then we introduce a seed on top of that mesh. We close the mesh, I mean, we close the chamber, and then we put it on drip irrigation to allow the uh, host plant to form enough roots. Upon formation of enough root mass, we open the chamber, and then we artificially infect the roots of those uh, hosts uh, with pregerminated striga seeds. And then we close the chamber, we take it back to the uh, sand, we drip irrigate it with long ashton media, whatever media, and then we allow interaction between the host and the parasite for uh, about 21 days, and then we score for resistance after 21 days. And the metrics that we use for scoring for resistance are uh, Striga length and the Striga number, and also Striga biomass. So we harvest all the Striga that was infesting the host crop, and then we put them on a petri plate, we take a photograph, and then we use image analysis to determine the number of strikes that were attached and the, uh, the length of the striker that was attached. Then you also weigh this and determine the, the biomass. And this forms a really neat and reproducible way of determining uh, resistance. So the more the attachments, then the less resistant the host, and the less the attachment, then the more resistant um, the host. So uh, very reproducible number of attachments, uh, number of attachments, and then uh, striga length, and then striga biomass. And, and these are comparable, and, and as we shall see later, they complement each other. Uh, we go further and determine histologically the mechanisms of this resistance, and, and we use uh, histological uh, analysis. Uh, we cut very thin sections, so five micron thin sections, at the interface of the host and the parasite. And we are able to tell a very susceptible response, and this is when the parasite has gone all the way into the host and established those um, very important vascular connections from a resistance response that the host is blocking the parasite from making those ingressions and making vascular connections and drawing food and nutrients from the parasite. And we do this in, uh, I said, high throughput, but not really high throughput. We wish we'd do more. Uh, so we do this in all drip fed uh, irrigation system. We are, about, we, we are able to do a few hundred, so you can do maybe 500 to 800 at one, at one go. But it forms a really neat and reproducible way of, of, of phenotyping striga for resistance. And this allows you to do some really cool genetics. Um, we also do uh, pre-attachment analysis, and in the pre-attachment analysis, all we do is to collect root exudate of the host. Okay, so we grow root hydroponically, uh, host crops hydroponically, then we draw the, the root exudate, and then we use that root exudate to stimulate germination of preconditioned the uh, striga seeds. And what that allows us to do is to measure the frequency or to assess for the frequency of germination. And we are able to do that because uh, once we take photographs of induced germination from the striga seeds, uh, we can again use image analysis to quantify uh, the frequency of this germination. And we added an additional uh, metric called uh, radical length. And the radical length is the distance from the Striga seed cut up to the end of the radical. And this is important to us because it tells us if the root exudate is, on, is not only able to stimulate germination, but it is able to sustain growth of Striga seedlings. Okay, so we are able to assay uh, firstly for post attachment, but we also have a way of assaying uh, very, uh, again, very reproducibly, uh, fairly high throughput for the germination stimulant activity, and also for the ability of the host to sustain, or the host root exudate to sustain striga seedlings, because that's important, as we shall see in a subsequent part of this discussion. 
All right, so let me now change gears or switch gears and, and talk very briefly about how we are able to harness and to obtain natural resistance. Uh, remember, uh, resistance is uh, combined as an integrated approach with other uh, striker management approaches is, is probably our best bet to, uh, to controlling striker. So how do we uh, harness for natural striker resistance? And this work started a while back and, and this hinges on a really well researched on hypothesis. Uh, so a lot of people would know, or a lot of population geneticists and evolutionary biologists will tell you that domestication has a cost and what, what, we, what we asked ourselves is that con conversion of uh, wild crop germplasm to domesticated germplasm uh, with many, many cycles of selection leads to loss of genetic diversity. Some of that genetic diversity that is lost may be very important for disease resistance, may be very important for striker management, may be very important for resistance genes. Because remember, striker and sorghum coexisted a while back with a very good balance. So, but for some reason, resistance was lost and virulence has built up over time. And so the questions we ask is, are we able to go back in time and harness those resistance? To answer that question, we took uh, a bunch of wild sorghum uh, relatives, so wild crop relatives of sorghum, uh, we grew them under field conditions. We determined uh, their resistance potential. And as you can see, there's a whole spectrum of resistance from here. There are highly resistant ones and then susceptible ones. But for the most part, the lines that we picked were very resistant. We took them through the lab assay to determine uh, which ones of these were resistant by the rhizotron assays, so post-attachment resistance. And we ended up with a set of uh, highly resistant sorghum, uh, wild sorghum accession. So these are in comparison to what is known about resistance in sorghum. So we tried this against N13, which is, which is a really, which is a highly resistant sorghum line. And most of these were, had resistance higher than N13 or any of the sorghum uh, genotypes that had been screened for striga resistance. So we then, took them further and determined the mechanisms of this resistance. Uh, so a susceptible interaction is such as the one that you're looking at uh, in figure in panel A, uh, but a resistant interaction is the one that you're looking at in panel C. And, and the most important of this is in addition to mechanical barrier resistance that we found in this uh, wild sorghum germplasm, we also found a resistance that was due to deposition of secondary metabolites, phenolic compounds that were blocking ingression of the host of the parasite into the host vasculature. So then this formed a really good basis for us to, to proceed and dissect the mechanisms of resistance. And we took a two-pronged approach, or we started with a transcriptome approach. And what we did was to uh, really design a straightforward experiment here. Uh, we took tissue at three days after infection, and then took tissue nine days after infection. So in this case, you are taking both host and parasite tissue. It is uh, what we describe as a dual RNA sequencing experiment. And you're sequencing both host and parasite tissue. And then after that has happened, after sequencing has happened, you can be able to separate out those reads. And you separate out those reads, you're able to know what's going on on the parasite side. And you're also able to make an inference and a comparison on the, on the host side. So the experiment consisted of all the wild uh, sorghum that we had. And then we also added in uh, a susceptible or cultivated variety. And then we, our infecting uh, pathogen was Striga uh, hamontica and Striga asiatica. And the controls were, of course, uh, Striga growing on its own, uh, sorghum growing on its own. So what came out of this work was uh, probably not very different from what we'd expect. So we had genes that were upregulated, uh, that were typical disease resistance genes, so like the leucine rich reputs. But what came out also more importantly are enzymes that are 
for degrading uh, pathogens that are coming into the into the host. So we found a lot of hydrosis, hydrolysis, and other cellular degrading enzymes. We also found uh, a number of enzymes that were important in cell wall fortification, or genes that encoded enzymes that were important in cell wall fortification. But the most interesting finding of this was that the more the resistant variety was, the more the genes were activated for resistance. So more resistant varieties tended to deploy more, resist, uh, more genes. And, and this spoke to the notion that they have a lot of resources of they have in them, genetic resources that they can deploy uh, for, for fighting the pathogen. Uh, we did the flip experiment, uh, but this uh, uh, but, but this time we looked at the Strega virulence. But before we did that, we also mapped the disease resistance genes uh, to see what pathways were upregulated. So uh, this just shows the cell wall genes as well as the pathogenesis related genes uh, on, the side, on the side of the host. On the side of the parasite, uh, we looked at the parasite virulence. And at this point, I want to slightly digress and, and start looking at Striga from a plant pathologist's perspective. So a uh, plant pathologist will tell you there is always a balance, uh, there's always increasing virulence from the parasite and there's always uh, host. So this is, a, this is like an arms race where the parasite is always trying to overcome resistance from the host. Um, and, and for Striga then we knew at that time or not so long ago, maybe about uh, 10 years ago, that Striga should start be, we should start looking at Striga like a, like, a, like a true pathogen, so like a manipulator of host defense systems. And the way that works is that Striga, like other fungal uh, pathogens, like other bacterial pathogens, would be releasing enabling molecules called effectors to overcome host defense. And so we wanted to look at those data set to see if there's any indication of Striga uh, virulence or if you can be able to predict Striga virulence genes. So we adopted this pipeline, uh, pipeline and this is uh, customized for Striga but really from, from extrapolated from bacteria and fungal pathogens. So we looked for hallmarks of what an effector would look like. Does it have a signal peptide? Is it short? Is it targeted, is it not targeted to the mitochondria? So we adopted this pipeline and then put uh, our reads and filtered them through. And then at the end of it, we made sure that these are differentially expressed at early stages of infection. So when we narrowed down to this data set and then combining all the other uh, effectors that we uh, all the other uh, expressions from the effectors, from the other, from all the hosts, we came up with the repertoire of effectors that we think are very important for, for interacting with the host. So what we did next to just make sure that there's interaction and that we can predict this interaction and that there are domains that actually interact with the host, uh, we, we did an approach for uh, host uh, protein-protein interactions uh, prediction between uh, Striga domains as well as uh, protein domains. And as you can see, these hubs that are formed uh, by Striga interacting with host uh, pathogens. So these have not been experimentally validated, but because of, by, for the, uh, as far as the domains are concerned, then these interactions uh, between Striga and the hosts. Uh, so we did uh, more further work and tried to determine what this was. And this came out as probably obvious candidates, but not really obvious, uh, because this is a striga, uh, which is a plant invading a host, which is also a plant. So these hallmarks of disease resistance or disease or pathology, uh, because striga is a is a parasite, uh, uh, but then there's also hallmarks of plant biology uh, parasite invading, invading uh, a plant host. More importantly, there are effectors that were uh, upregulated in both stages, so early parasitism and later uh, parasitism. So cluster one consisted of this uh, 
host effectors or parasite effectors. So a very small subset that were uh, differentially expressed or upregulated in both stages of, of parasitism and this stayed on until uh, day nine. Then you have another set of uh, effector molecules that were only upregulated during early stages of parasitism. And then this shut down in later stages of parasitism. And then you have others that were media or medium level differentially expressed, uh, but this were expressed again in all stages of parasitism. Again, another important finding here was that uh, for Strager effectors, these were more for the more resistant varieties. And for the more susceptible varieties, for the susceptible varieties, they tended to deploy less of these effectors. Um, and this included pectin methyl uh, esterases, lipases, glucanases, extensins, and expansins. So, I just want to conclude this uh, section, but conclude it at, by looking at Strager in the offense and then looking at Sogam in the defense. So these are two sides of the same coin. So Strager is bringing in its effectors that are making it gain entry into the host, but then the host is fighting back. And I just want to use the example of pectin methyl esterase. So these are enzymes that make the pectin, which is a constituent of the cell wall, are uh, very weak. So the more pectin methyl esterases you have, then the more, the weaker the cell, the cell wall. But then there's an inhibitor of pectin methyl esterase, and this is pectin methyl esterase inhibitors. And what this, this do is to inhibit pectin methyl esterases. And so what you'd have is if you have inhibition on the part of the host, and we don't know this, but if the host is producing a, a methyl, a pectin methyl esterase inhibitor, as some of them poked up, and if it is inhibiting uh, the pectin methyl esterase from Striga, then that would help explain a situation where you have more lignified or more strengthened cell wall. So in a susceptible uh, uh, interaction, then you have most of those uh, cell wall integrity material breaking down, uh, but in a resistant uh, interaction, you have inhibitors of hydrolysis, you have inhibitors of the offense that's coming from Strega, but you also have strengthening of the cell wall from lignification and other mechanisms that strengthen the cell. Uh, but beyond that, you also have signaling that trigger or start uh, other reactions that stop the host uh, the, the parasite from invading the host. So now a more, uh, a bigger, and this consists of a large number, I think uh, about a 300 or 400 subset of a larger uh, set of sorghum that represent the global diversity of sorghum. And this panel was important to us because most of the Jamplasm was sourced from Africa. So you can see uh, the dots there, the color dots represent the origin from where these uh, land races were collected. Uh, not just land races, but most of the uh, sorghum that is grown in this region. So it would be land races, it could be advanced cultivars, it could be breeding material, and also represented wild crop relatives of sorghum. And the phylogeny there just shows the distribution of this. So it was a really good mix of, of different, and it captured the, the total diversity of sorghum, we believe. So these have been genotyped by sequencing. So there's GBS data for them. And so we used those SNPs or GBS-based SNPs to carry out uh, genome-wide association mapping for Strega resistance. So we used our, uh, Rhizotron uh, system to phenotype for Strega resistance. And we saw a whole breadth of spectrum. So we had highly resistant uh, germplasm that did not have many attachments or so one or two attachments to one uh, germplasm that had a large number of, of attachments and others that had really long attachments, meaning that they were supporting the parasite very well. So this was good for us. And I just want to highlight or give a sneak peek into what we saw. Uh, so the 
blue dots uh, the, on the dot plots, the blue represent uh, the jamplazine that were more resistant than what we know or that what was considered a strega resistant varieties. So N13 is a highly resistant organ variety, as is 9830. Uh, and this jamplasm that we had had higher resistance or comparable resistance to this jamplasm. So A is uh, attachments, so number of attachments, and then B is strega length, and then C is uh, uh, strega biomass. And the blue, as I said, represent uh, genotypes that were uh, similar in resistance or higher than the uh, standards or the controls that we had uh, for Strega resistance. And then the orange represent the ones that were just next in the in mean separation. So if you look at the heat map, uh, and it, this is based on rank summation index, so overall resistance based on number of attachments, Strega biomass, as well as uh, Strega length, you see the rank here, uh, N13 is almost at the bottom, and this is a highly resistant variety, and then you have 9830. So this tells you there's a few dozens of sorghum varieties that are highly resistant. And the most important thing about this is that some of them are land races, others are advanced material, others are breeding material. So this can directly go into breeding programs without further improvement, and then the wild ones can serve as sources for resistance in, in breeding programs or genetic studies. So what we did next was to dissect the mechanisms of resistance for these guys. And uh, A is what you'd expect in a typical uh, susceptible interaction. So you see the big pipes again going for the jugular also known as the xylem of the host. And then you see others getting stopped very earlier on during parasitism. And then others getting stopped uh, midway at the cortex or at the, at the uh, endodermis. So this represented uh, new and other previously determined uh, mechanisms of resistance. Uh, and then when you put them to GWAS, those mechanisms of resistance were resonating back to us, okay? So I talked about metabolites of polyphenolic compounds that are deposited at the interface of the host and the parasite. And, and what we found to be uh, very highly associated with this resistance is secretion of defense molecules. So PDRLs or ATP uh, binding cassettes transporter were found to be uh, significantly associated. Isoflavone reductases that have also been implicated in production of secondary metabolites in other infections, including parasitic plants, also significantly associated. But most importantly, the cell wall seemed like a very important barrier uh, because we found glucanases that inhibit uh, or digest uh, my pathogens or pathogen material that's coming into the host. Uh, we found xylanases uh, or inhibitors of, of these enzymes. And then we also found signaling molecules. And these are hallmarks for um, what triggers defense mechanisms and really uh, hallmarks for hypersensitive reaction. And the hypersensitive reaction was one of the most prominent uh, resistance mechanisms we saw on, on the highly resistant neoplasm. So again, talking to us back about the resistance of mechanisms that we, uh, that we earlier saw and giving it uh, genetic uh, relevance. So to conclude this section, uh, there is resistance that occurs very early on, post-attachment resistance. So this occurs at the epidemics it can occur at the epidermis level, although this is really, really rare. And then there's resistance that occur at the cortex level. So Strega has managed to go in, but it is blocked by mechanisms in the cell, uh, such as lignification, such as fortification of the cell wall. And then there is also resistance that occurs at the cortex level. So here it has gone maybe a, a, a notch in, I mean endodermis, it has gone past the cortex and almost approaching the, uh, the vascular connection. And this can be because of, you know, uh, again, cell wall barriers. It could be deposition of cell uh, phenolic compounds or uh, 
compounds that inhibit progression of the parasite, or it could very well be a hypersensitive reaction that is triggered uh, at the interface of the host and parasite. And, and this is uh, one of the mechanisms that we are able to, to observe. All right, so I started with mechanisms of resistance being pre-attachment and post-attachment resistance. So you also wanted to find out on this panel of SOGAM what the resistance was with regard to pre-attachment resistance. So I said that most striga hosts stimulate uh, germination of the parasite by producing these germination stimulants called strigolactrons. So it turns out not all hosts are able to stimulate effective germination of the parasite. Uh, so you have one or two or just a few uh, seedlings germinating in response to the roast host exudate. These are called low germination stimulant sorghum. And it turns out that the low germination stimulant loci or the LGS1 loci is a region of, at the bottom of chromosome five and narrowing down or homing in on the, on the large QTL on that chromosome 5 that had been identified earlier, it turns out that this is a gene, uh, this is a gene called sulfotransferase. And what this sulfotransferase does is to convert stregolactones that are not uh, active, that are very active into uh, not active stregolactones. So for example, you have orobancol and you have 5 deoxystrigol so you have high proportions of orobancol in low germination stimulants compared to high germination stimulants that have 5 deoxystrigol and this is implicated or implicated to the sulfotransferase gene so effectively mutants of sulfotransferase or mutants of LGS1 such as SRN39 should not be able to stimulate striga to germinate or do not effectively stimulate Strega to germinate. It also turns out that this LGS1 loci is quite widespread and it is widespread in regions that overlap with Strega resistance, with, with sorghum cultivation. So in Africa, where you have centers of domestication of sorghum, uh, where you also have Strega infestations, mutants of LGS1 tend to be in this region. So what we did was to go in with a large panel. We genotyped all these uh, uh, striga, all, all these sorghum lines, and we genotyped for markers linked to LGS1. And again, I will just show you that uh, some of them were highly effective in stimulating germination, others were not effective in gem uh, stimulating germination. And we took two metrics for uh, resistance uh, using radical length as well as germination stimulant. Uh, this is a sneak peek into what we saw. So the red, the blue, again, represents uh, the resistant varieties. And these resistant varieties are in comparison to what is known about resistance in uh, pre-attachment resistance. So you're looking at resistance compared to SRN39, which is LGS1 mutant. And a bunch of them, or a large number of them, were more resistant than SRN39 or comparable to SRN39. So again, uh, in addition to discovering uh, new genes or new loci that code for, uh, for these genes, uh, we were also able to identify a large number of germplasm that can be directly infused into breeding programs because they are of the status of uh, advanced cultivars, others are breeding material, and others are actually being cultivated as land races, even though their resistance to striga is not known. And if you look at the rank summation index, so summing, in, uh, summing up uh, resistance due to radical length and resistance because of germination stimulant, then you'd see that they rank quite well. SRN39 is maybe somewhere here in the middle, uh, this 9830. So there is a large number of germplasm that were resistant. So this uh, here are higher than SRN39, so about 10 are higher than SRN39. Others are comparable to SRN39. And then the blue here or the green here 
uh, represent genotypes that are slightly lower than SRN39 with regard to resistance. So what came out also out of that study was not all the genotypes that were resistant had the LGS1 deletion. So there are some genotypes that did not have the LGS1 mutation, but were also highly resistant. And so what this led us to believe is that there are other uh, genes or other uh, enzymes or other interactions that are uh, responsible for striga pre-attachment resistance. So we used DATSEC, we genotyped the whole uh, uh, panel or not really the whole panel that we had, uh, about uh, 167 genotypes. And then we uh, did GWAS on this. So what came out of this was not anything directly linked to low germination stimulant loci, not at the region of chromosome five, but this pointed us another direction. So what we were able to pick was uh, genes or genes that encoded uh, hormones that were closely associated with dormancy and abscisic acid. So we found uh, the synthesis of uh, abscisic acid, regulators of abscisic acid, the synthesis and regulators of hormones that regulate abscisic acid. So this was uh, somewhat interesting to us. And so to intrigued by this finding, we went further to characterize these peaks. And it came out further that we have other genes that are associated with abscisic acid and dormancy. So for example, we found AP2, uh, abscisic acid insensitive one, R5, uh, and other genes that are uh, metabolic, but associated with abscisic acid and dormancy. So really, we, there's not so much that's known about the interactions of hormones uh, during germination. We mostly know that it is a stregolactone that causes this germination, but we were interested to look at the haplotypes uh, and see if there's something more that we can uh, determine from these interactions pre-attachment. So you're looking at uh, box plots of uh, different genes that were identified in the GWAS study pre-attachment. Uh, and one of them is the novel interactor of gismonic acid, which is a regulator of abscisic acid. And the haplotypes were uh, significantly differentiated in terms of uh, germination uh, frequency. And then uh, other genes also that are involved in the dormancy cycle, while also the haplotypes were, had significantly different germination frequencies in the uh, in the panel. So this led us to uh, think through and sort of form a hypothesis to explain this data. So this is really preliminary and there's so much that, and, and I'm sure this model will, will change, but we look at striga seeds at three stages. So we look at it at the dormant stage, we look at it at the non-dormant uh, stage and then when it is germinated, and then try to make inferences for the hormones and the hormonal crosstalk that could be here. So we know for sure that, uh, and inferred from other uh, seed germination data, we know that GA stimulates the state of dormancy. So GA will stimulate dormancy release. We also know that ABA inhibits dormancy release. We also know that JA through interactions with jasmonic acid um, transcription factors, JAS and Ninja, regulates ABA I5, and this in turn regulates the amount of uh, sensitivity and the, and the biosynthesis of abscisic acid. We also know that you can be able to achieve germination of strig acids by just simply removing the seed coat. And so enzymes like transparent tester one that encodes uh, factors that are involved in the integument development makes sense 
if they identified in that uh, GWAS study. And also AP2, which is a regulator of abscisic acid. But beyond that, we don't know uh, much and we, we are just making inferences. So the red here represent the uh, genes or uh, factors that were associated with, uh, with our GEO study in the pre-attachment resistance. And most of these were found either in the upstream regulatory regions or in the coding sequences of the gene. So after germination, then the story is a little more straightforward because we know stregolactone will induce germination after pre-attachment. Uh, we also know that GA combined with inhibited ABA would achieve stregolactone-free germination. We also know that ethylene can achieve stregolactone-free or stregolactone-free uh, germination of streg acids. And so we are still looking at this hormonal crosstalk uh, to determine what goes on uh, pre-attachment, I mean, at the dormant stage, at the non-dormant stage, uh, but then there could also be some influence, and this is important to us post-germination. So we know that ABA is not a good hormone during uh, seed uh, radical development, and so we know it inhibits. Uh, so what what we are doing right now is to do experiments to de to determine which which one of these hormones are doing what and at what stage. But but certainly there is there is very good and there's very intricate hormonal crosstalk at the stage of pre-attachment uh, resistance, which cannot be solely attributed to Strager, um, uh, stregolactone analysis. So this is my second to last slide, I believe. And here I'm just going to make some perspectives and future inferences and what we hope to achieve in the next couple of years. And one of them is to be able to validate these gene targets using uh, genome editing. So CRISPR-Cas9 system has provided us tools to be able to go in and target uh, genes or genetic regions for, for not only functional genomics or functional genetics, but also to develop striker resistance. And a really good case is uh, getting rid of the LGS1 region. So if you drop off that region, then you achieve striker resistance. And the other gene targets too that can be able to to, we can tinker with that can be able to provide resistance against Traeger. Uh, conclusions, truly my last slide. Uh, while SOGAM is a good reservoir for Traeger resistance as we see, and then resistance and virulence should be looked at, at together as same sides of the same coin. And then uh, Traeger uses numerous mechanisms to, uh, as SOGAM uses Traeger, uh, SOGAM uses numerous mechanisms to overcome striga resistance. Uh, and then there's certainly hormonal crosstalk at the stage of pre-germination uh, in, in striga. And, and genome editing provides opportunities for, for teasing this out and also for developing resistance against the parasite. So with that, I just want to thank my university and a lot of people who've been very uh, generous with their funding. So our National Research Fund, which has supported us, uh, USAID uh, through the National Academy of Sciences, the Royal Society, which is funding some work on genome editing, uh, the International Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology, which was very generous uh, to fund some of the interactions that uh, between host and parasite that we have done. Uh, Coteva, who are our partners in the genome editing platform, uh, Penn State, who we continue to work with, ICRISAT, uh, uh, ISA, who, uh, who are also our partners in some of the projects, but mostly my PhD students and master's students who did all this work. I did not hold up a pet one day. All this data is generated by my students. So thank you, Lara, and happy Africa Day, everybody. <laughs>